you know, somebody reached out to me and asked me what I was going to speak about, and I wasn't really sure, so it it made me uh, kind of pin me down here. So, <laughs> so here we go. I had kind of on my heart to speak about certain aspects of the work of Christ and his atoning work on Calvary's cross, and hence the title that I gave to Andrea. I think it was Blood and Water. So. To start with, let's read some passages in John's Gospel and in John's Epistle. The first well-known passage in John 19. John 19, and we can start with verse uh, 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar... He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, he sought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierce. And now let's turn to John's first epistle. John's first epistle in verse... Chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then over in chapter 5, first epistle of John, chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 6. And I'm going to take the liberty to read this in the English translation of J.M. Darby. First John 5 and 6. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus the Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness, for the spirit is truth. For they that bear witness are three, the spirit and the water and the blood. And the three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has witnessed concerning his son. I was noticing the other day, in the Gospels, I guess it was, yes, Lord's Day morning early, that the other three Gospels quote the centurion that was standing by, and he was given to make exclamations, certainly or truly, this was the Son of God. I think it's put that way in Matthew and Mark, if I remember right. And then in Luke, it says, I believe truly this was a righteous man. And then we come to John's gospel. We flip over and we say, well, I wonder how it puts it there. But, you know, we don't have those words of men. And it's interesting to link it up with what we just read in 1 John chapter 5, the witness of God. And so there, instead of having the centurion making a true statement, 
we have God giving the witness himself from the side of a dead Christ. And so <clears throat> today I'd like to speak a little bit about what the blood and the water speak to us about these two uh, very clear, powerful aspects of the work of Christ. But before I do, I will say this, because there's always a chance that someone maybe doesn't have the assurance of faith. Maybe someone has not yet sure that they have found acceptance with God through Christ. And I will just say this, we're going to spend some time speaking about the work of Christ. And we're going to speak about it as believers because it's for our enjoyment and to undergird us in such a way that it, it makes us worshipers. But I, I've been told this or read it, that if there's a hundred places or so in the New Testament which, which enjoins the reader, exhorts the reader to believe, 98 of them are to believe on his person. We believe on him. And I think there's only two places, if I remember right, should have looked this up before. There's only two places where it directs us to believe on his work. And that's very interesting. For myself, when I came to the Lord and accepted him as my savior, I knew just about nothing of the work of Christ. I didn't know anything about the blood of Christ or really even the death of Christ. I knew that he was alive and that I needed to come to terms and bow the knee to him. And that's what I did. And I say all this because when the person believes in the simplicity of faith on Christ Jesus, all the value of everything that he has done is made good to us. I think that's a wonderful thought. For over 40 years, I and many brothers and sisters that I have known for a long time and fellowship with, we've been pondering, studying, digging into the details of the work of Christ. It is a lifelong and a happy pursuit. But again, I just want to say at the start that if you're not sure of the status of your soul, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and direct you to his person and thou shalt be saved. And all the value of all that he's done justified you, reconciled you to himself. He has redeemed you, cleansed you, and all these multiple blessings all flow to you. And it's good as time, as we're left here and as we grow in grace as believers and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we understand more and more of the riches that are ours in Christ. So I just say that as a, a preface <laughs> to digging into some of these wonderful details. Now I want to tell a story that I have told before. And it, can, and it illustrates, I think, two main aspects of the work of Christ as it applies to you and me. Back when we lived in Maine, uh, it was a it's cold country and the frost goes deep in the ground. And when spring comes, which it seems like it takes forever to come, but when spring finally comes, it starts with a thaw. And all of this frozen ground, many feet deep, just turns to muck. And so we say, we used to say in Maine that there's five seasons. There's, uh, there's summer, and then there's autumn or fall, and then there's winter, and then there's mud season, and then there's spring. And so when it was mud season and we're trying to get the children ready for meeting, you know, and or in between meetings at the meeting room that is still there in, in Palmyra, we would tell as we're working on some of them and the others are already ready to go and say, don't, don't go off the, don't go off the deck. You've got your good uh, sneakers on or your good clothes. Don't go off the deck. And uh, we would tell them that uh, out front of the Palmyra meeting room, there's a little concrete aid. We say, don't go off the, don't go off the patio. And so if a child uh, went off the patio, uh, deep into the muck, they would go, or the little girl with her 
little tights on would have mud up to her shins and or a little boy the same with his trousers and and so now there's two problems one is they disobeyed and they're guilty the second is that they're defiled they're full of mud wet mud and they have to be changed before they come in and the aspect of the work of Christ wonderfully for you and me deals with both we were <clears throat> We were guilty, and the blood of Christ has been shed for us as an expiation, as, a, as an atonement to God. All sin ultimately is against God primarily. You transgress your neighbor, then you, you are indebted to that neighbor for what you have done. But the sin against anyone is really a sin primarily against God. And secondly, we are defiled by sin. And the work of Christ is availed for you and me in both aspects. And so when we think of the blood of Christ, we think of being cleansed judicially. We think of our guilt being washed away. When we think of the water of Christ, we think of new life. And the work of the Spirit of God, which I hope we'll get into shortly, the work of the Spirit of God makes good to us initiates in us, brings to us a new life. And we are in a clean place. We have been washed clean from the defilement of sin, as well as the guilt of sin. But the defilement of sin, we are cleansed from by, the, by that water. Now, both came from the side of a dead Christ. New life can only be enjoyed on the other side of death. It required his death. And the scriptures are plain about that. They saw that he was dead already. And the soldiers sent a spear in. And so when we think of the work on Calvary's cross, we think, we think of the three hours of darkness that the man Christ Jesus bore and, 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 and absorbed in his own person. The full wrath of a sin-hating God against sin. We think of his death because the wages of sin is death. And we think of the blood because the blood had to be shed to make an atonement for sin. As everyone recalls in the earliest chapters of the Bible in Exodus chapter 12, Jehovah said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. <clears throat> And so it's from the side of a dead Christ. His death was necessary to forge for us through his death and resurrection a new place. A place where now we can know ourselves to be justified from all things. Judicially before God, we are not only looked upon as those who are not guilty with sin. But we have a life, and I don't want to stray too far here, but we have a life to which sin has never attached. And that's a wonderful aspect of the gospel, justified of life. <clears throat> so let's spend a little time, keeping an eye on the clock here, on this first aspect of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is the foundation, God's righteous foundation, whereby he, can be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We get that. Let's turn back to uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Well, let's back up. Verse 22, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation or mercy seat through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission or passing over 
of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In man's way of thinking, in our way of thinking, God had a quandary. We know and have learned that the nature of God is such that God is light, is holy, and God is love. How can God pour his love out on sinful man and still be a God of light? When man departed so quickly out of the way and brought such dishonor and defilement into God's world, he could have shut everything down and still been righteous. But where would have been the satisfaction of his love? At the cross of Christ, these things meet together. Righteousness and peace, mercy and truth have met together at Calvary's cross. And God has found a way where his banished ones might be returned unto him in righteousness. And so God has laid himself a righteous foundation that he can not only be the justifier of you and me, sinners, but he can be just in doing it. And that foundation is the blood, the precious blood of Christ. If you will recall in Leviticus chapter 16, a very important chapter that speaks of what took place on the Day of Atonement, you will see there that there were two goats. The one goat called the scapegoat was slain and his blood was taken into the holiest place and sprinkled once on the mercy seat. God only needs to see it once. The epistle to the Hebrews is filled with that expression in English once. Once in the end of the age hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You'll see that word over and over again. <clears throat> but he sprinkled that blood seven times before the mercy seat because that speaks of our approach. Perfect, perfect display of God's righteousness. And so it is that... <clears throat> The second goat, the priest put his hands upon that goat and all the sins of the people are confessed upon that goat and off it's taken by a fit man into the wilderness, into a place uninhabited. And so it is that <clears throat> our sins for you and me who have put our trust in Christ have been taken away. But again, the foundation is the blood of Christ. And... <clears throat> We will see if we go back to 1 John chapter 2. Again, 1 John's first epistle. We see a very interesting packet passage that is not always understood. <clears throat> In 1 John chapter 2, we read, if any man sin, verse 1, we. We believers, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You'll see that the word sins of are in italics. You can leave them in, you can take them out. It doesn't, in my judgment, impact the meaning of the passage. And what this passage teaches us, among other things, is that the work of Christ on Calvary's cross has so glorified God that God can, can, can come out to whosoever will and offer salvation and offer mercy. Why? Because the blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat. Because as we read in 2 Corinthians, uh, I think it's in chapter 5, Verse 50, he died for all. In 1 Timothy 2, 6, we read about the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. And so the love of God has, has sent his son, as we read in John 3, 16. 
And the work of the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross is sufficient that every single man, woman, and child could be saved through it. It's important to see this. He didn't just die for believers. Christ died for all. Whoever you meet in whatever country, whatever religion they have, whatever state they're in, there are a couple things you can say to them on the authority of God's word. One is God loves you because God so loved the world. The great love of compassion. You can say to whoever you meet, I know something about you. God loves you. The second thing you can say is Christ died for you. That's the aspect we have in 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. He has met God's holy demand with respect to our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. My dear brother Bruce Anstey puts it this way. It made the whole world savable. <laughs> I get a kick out of him and the way he expresses things. Very, very nice, very clear. Made the whole world savable because he's the propitiation for our sins. And so propitiation <clears throat> is God's side of the cross. And it is irrespective of the transfer or removal of guilt. It's God's side. You remember in 1 Kings chapter 17, when Elijah goes to the widow woman of Sarepta, She's outside the gate. She's gathering sticks. She's going to make her last meal for herself and her son. She's at, the, she's at her wit's end. She's all done. And Elisha says, bring me some water. And she goes to get the water. And he says, oh, bring me a little cake. Bring me something to eat, too. And she said, I've got a little, I've got a handful of meal and a little bit of oil. I'm going to make it for me and my son. We're going to eat it and then that's it. And then we're going to die. And he says, make me a little cake first. Now, humanly speaking, this is the most insensitive man that you have ever heard. You come across a helpless widow at the very end of a rope, as we say in English. And you're worried about yourself. But Elijah really is a picture of sweeter things than that. He knew that she was going to be sustaining him. The Lord had told him so. He knew that there would be resources and plenty in that home when he arrived there. He was not worried about that. But it illustrates the point. That is that God's side of the cross comes first. And he has seen the blood. And he has been glorified. In John chapter 13, there is a beautiful passage. And you will notice the absence of reference to you and me or to our sins. I'm going to read it. John 13. 31. <clears throat> this is after the Lord Jesus has uh, met with the disciples in the upper room, had that last supper, washed their feet and so on. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, he shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. God has been glorified by the work his son accomplished on Calvary's cross in the shedding of his blood. And when we preach the gospel or tell the gospel to a classmate or to a friend or to a relative or whomever, it's, it's, it's a happy thing, a good thing, a solid thing to put before them that all things are ready. Point to the person and to the work of Christ, that the door has been flung open, that the, the, the enemy has defeat, been defeated like those four leprous men discovered at the entering into the gate of the Samaria. The enemy has been routed. The, the famine can be over because the blood is on the mercy seat. God has been glorified, and now his love can go out righteously to whosoever will. But just to finish with those two goats, that, 
that aspect of propitiation. This is indeed the foundation. And you can say, as we, as we just rehearsed to anyone that you need, God loves you and Christ died for you, but you cannot tell them that Christ bore their sins in his own body on the tree. That's only true for the believer. That's only true for the person that lays hold by faith of the value of his work, lays hold by faith of himself, and the work is made good to the soul. Only the believer can say, he was my substitute, he bear my sins in his own body on the tree. And that is what you hope the person will lay hold of in response to the offer and to the to the invitation, to the statement that all things are ready. Well, we could go on and on about the blood of Christ happily. A wonderful, wonderful subject. God righteously raised the Lord Jesus from amongst all the rest of the dead, <clears throat> assigning him a new place as man on the right hand of the majesty on high. And it was a righteous thing. You say, well, it was love that God raised the Lord Jesus. You know, indeed it was love, but it was righteous. When God contemplated, if I could put it this way, what he saw accomplished by his son on Calvary's cross. It's as if the question, it's as if he would raise the question, what is my response to this? My son pouring out his soul. He gave himself, not just, he gave everything. He sold all that he had, gave everything. What's my what can I do for my son? I'll raise him up from among all the rest of the dead. And then I'll give him glory. And then I'll give him a seat at my right hand. And then I'm going to tell him to sit thou on my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. And then I'm going to give him the highest place and the headship of all created things in the universe, not only on earth, but in heaven too. That's righteous. Yes, it's love, but it was righteous of God to reward the Lord Jesus, the man Christ Jesus with that glory, because he went down and humbled himself to the lowest possible place. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well, let's move on from the blood. We remember that it's the foundation. And we remember, as I use the analogy of the little children going out into the mud, that the blood of Christ has cleansed us judicially from all from the guilt of all our sins. And so now we are justified. And beyond that, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son. But now there's another question, and that has to do with our state. Because as you can imagine, uh, you could go to, uh, into a uh, uh, high security prison, you could go to death row, and you could, you could, if you had the power, you could offer pardon to them all. You are no longer guilty of the sentence of death. You could also set them free. Give them a clean slate. But that does not mean that they would be comfortable in your company. That does not mean you would be comfortable having them in your company. That does not mean you could have them when they get out. Let's go have a cup of coffee and enjoy things together. None of that comes with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a wonderful blessing to have the forgiveness of sins, all sins for all eternity. But God has blessed us even in higher things than that, if I could say so. Because by the basis of his son's work on Calvary's cross, and by a work he has done in you and in me, he will fulfill throughout all eternity the desire of his heart to give you and me a capacity and a desire to have fellowship with him. <clears throat> It's been said that God would have never given you and me life if he didn't have the blood in view. And this is why, as we read in 1 John, 
chapter 5, as we read there in verse 6, 1 John 5 and verse 6, this is he that came by water and blood, even by Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. The subject in John's first epistle is the character of the new life that he has now communicated to you and me. At one time, this life existed solid, alone in a solitary way in the son himself. He was that eternal life. And he was it for all eternity. He came here and was born of a virgin. And the angelic testimony was that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. A new condition, a new place taken by the eternal son, taking manhood to himself. And the spirit of God, you might say, is right there to, to confirm that he is still who he was, despite who he had become. That holy thing, the son of God. But now in 1 John, we read about, we read this, this wonderful expression. I can find it here quickly. Which thing is true in him and in you? Let's see if I can pluck that out of here. 1 John 2 and verse Eight. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, 1 John 2 and 8. Which thing is true in him and in you? For the darkness is passing, the true light already shines. Now that life has been reproduced. It has been communicated in sovereign grace to you and me. Our sins have been addressed righteously. And God is free to communicate to you and me life and it's the life that is in his son the word of god calls it in the new testament eternal life eternal life the lord jesus had said before the cross when the when the uh, when the greeks wanted to see him they went to i think it was philip first and then andrew and said sir we would see jesus what a what a, what a wonderful desire. And how it must have pained the heart of the Lord to not be able to satisfy their desire at that time. He couldn't even desire in the next chapter, John 13, the desire of his own. Lord, Peter said, we'll go with you. The Lord had to say, you can't follow me now, Peter. I'm going to a place you can't come, but you can follow me later. And so he says in John 12, <clears throat> except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That fruit is all around us today. I'm looking at your faces. You are part of that much fruit. You have a life that has been communicated to you. Called eternal life. How did you get it? God gave it to you as his sovereign choice. He set his mind, he set his heart upon you personally. He chose you. Personally, election is not corporate for believers. It is personal. National election was true of Israel. It's not true of the church. He chose us one by one. He chose you personally. <clears throat> and he chose you for a destiny. Predestination is a destiny picked out in advance. And those whom he chooses, he picks out for a destiny. That destiny, that place was made possible by the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
because that's our place to be in him, in resurrection life. When time came, he called you and he justified you. And maybe later today, he'll glorify you in me. <clears throat> and that's sovereign grace on his part. And so <clears throat> in John, getting back to first John, so much of what John takes up there in his epistle is the character of this new life. It loves. It rejoices in the truth. It obeys a hint, the commandments of the Lord. It turns from evil, all of these characteristics of the new life. But then in the fifth chapter, towards the end of the epistle, he reminds us, it's not by water only, but by water and blood. In other words, God would have not been free to sovereignly give you and me life if it weren't for the blood. Not by water only, not only by new life, but by that price paid to establish a righteous basis that God can bring you and I into such favor and still be righteous in doing it. Now, we read in 1 John 4 early on while we're here, and we have these two aspects, I believe, portrayed in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 is the water. Verse 10 is the blood. I'll read them again. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's life. That's the water. In verse 10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the blood. And as we said, <clears throat> there was a testimony at the cross from the centurion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But God took care of the testimony himself in the gospel by John. The water and the blood. And he refers to it in 1 John chapter 5 and adds the wonderful, beautiful aspect of the spirit. There are three that bear witness. The spirit, the water. And the blood. We could consider the fact that the blood is mentioned first in John 19 because it's the foundation of everything. And then the water. But in your and my experience, it was different. The spirit worked in your dark soul and mind, just like in Genesis chapter one. The spirit moved upon the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then. The word of God comes and God said repeatedly and man is made and placed in an environment of God's choosing. And so in first John five, as we read there around verse eight and nine, this is the witness of God, which he's testified of his son, the spirit, the water and the blood. It is interesting in passing. That when we look in some of the Old Testament types, for example, of the priests, Aaron and his sons as priests, what happened with them? They were bathed, they were washed all over with water. Blood was sprinkled upon the tip of their right ear, the tip of their right thumb, the tip of their right toe. And the oil was sprinkled upon them. We move forward to the leper and the cleansing of a leper. And what do we see? We see washing. We see water, we see blood, we see oil. And so these are beautiful types of these aspects of the work of Christ that avail for you and me. Let's turn back to John chapter 13. We noticed in 1 John, when we read about propitiation, we read about Christ as our advocate with the Father, not with God there, but with the Father. <clears throat> when you think about it, it is obvious there is no second sprinkling of blood. In 1 John, it doesn't say he was 
or he shall be. It says he is the propitiation for our sins. One of the hymns we sing in English, the blood forever speaks in God's omniscient ear. And so if we fail, if we sin, there's no fresh sprinkling of the blood. It's been shed once. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It points back to that shed blood on Calvary's cross, shed once. And its efficacy, its, its, its value, the power of its value, if I can put it that way, is always there, never undone, never dissipated. And the sinner resorts to it. And he's, his relationship is unchanged. His communion and fellowship and enjoyment of it has been damaged. And that is what is restored. In contrast with that, when we go to John 13, we will read the aspect of the water as a one-time cleansing. You will recall when Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his first epistle, the next chapter after, after chapter 5, where he has to instruct them as to the man that had been, was commonly known to be a fornicator. In the next chapter in 1 Corinthians 6, he says to them in their presence, what he describes, he describes in verses 9 and 10, 1 Corinthians 6, a list of things, unrighteous things, fornication, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, and so on, down through verse 10. Verse 11, such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. We are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. This washing is the moral cleansing that the water that proceeded from the side of the dead Christ speaks of. It is a moral cleansing that has more to do with our state than our standing. Because remember, we were the little boy or the little girl that got off in the mud and and uh, we had to deal with, a, with, a, with an angry parent judicially. And then we have to deal with defilement. And so there is cleansing morally from the defilement of sin, as I have repeated several times. And in John 13, when Peter, who first was abhorrent at the idea that the Lord Jesus would wash his feet, uh, and then he goes to the other extreme and says, wash me all over. Then, then in verse 10, the Lord Jesus responds. Jesus saith to him, he that is bathed. It's a different word in the original language. You can look it up. He that is bathed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. But not all, because Judas was there. Judas was not clean. The work of the Spirit of God in Judas's soul had not produced fruit. He did not have new life, as far as the Lord Jesus tells us here. But then the Lord Jesus goes and he washes their feet. Water, again. And so, with blood, it's one time. With water, it's in a certain sense one time, but in another sense it's repeated because we continuously need the washing of water by the word. It's very, to me, it's sublime in the difference when we think of how the water, which is the application by the Spirit of God, of the word of God to our hearts, our consciences, and it produces an effect with the tip of our ears, with the tip of our thumbs and the tip of our right toe. We go back to John chapter three, just in closing. And in verse five, the well-known exchange between the Lord Jesus and Nicodemus. In verse five, verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone, everyone that is born of the spirit. And so on. We learn in these early chapters of John that except the Spirit of God works by applying the Word of God to the inner man, to the soul, to the spirit of a human, that there will not be life. <clears throat> life and faith are together. One does not come before the other. Without the sovereign work in the soul by the Spirit of God to apply his word, that and God said from the very first page of the Bible, there will not be the ability to enter into the kingdom of God, nor even to see the kingdom of God, nor to receive the things that are of God. There won't be the capacity and how important it is to him that we have a capacity. You know, he could have just, just saved our sins and removed our guilt and just let us go our way. Wander, wander away. No, that was the, he put away our sins. He had a purpose in that. He had a purpose. He had a purpose to give us a life that has capacity and has a characteristic desire for an enjoyment of the very things that he enjoys. And so in John 15, let us be merry. For this my son was dead. God looks for and will achieve throughout the eternal ages, a fellowship with the children of men. It was his counsel before the worlds were made he had delight in the habitable parts of his earth, and his delights were in the children of men. So we see in John 3 an amazing truth that it was God that worked in my soul, and I thought it was just me. When my neighbor brought me the gospel, I thought, I've got to do something with this. And I was a miserable young man for about two weeks. Miserable. Finally, I felt I had no choice. There, I did it. And then shortly thereafter, a brother, older brother, found me, took me under his wing and said, Brother, read this verse. I am found of them that sought me not. <laughs> and he said, You know, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I haven't gotten over him telling me that for over 45 years. Why me? Why me? It has laid the foundation practically in my soul to be a worshiper. Because what else can we say? But thank you. What else can we do but adore the love that extracted you and me from the broad road? We were hell bent on that broad road that leads to destruction. And he apprehended us. Why? And so <clears throat> I learned early on in the gospel as a young man that I wasn't going to go around telling everybody they needed to be born again because a guy walked up to my friend and he said, you're right, I want to be born again. How can I do it? <laughs> and we looked at each other foolishly. <laughs> we didn't know what to say. Well, I stopped doing that. Life comes from God. It doesn't come from another human. Natural life can, in that sense, be the vehicle of it. But life comes from God. But we preach the gospel to man based on his responsibility. Because the scriptures are filled with responsibility from beginning to end. And we press upon souls that it's not just an option like on a on a buffet table. Oh, you can take some of this or take some of that. You can pick your religion or pick none. 
No, it's not that way. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It is the command of God. He tells the sinner, repent and believe and honor, bow the knee to my son. And if man refuses, God will be forced to take man up on his failed responsibility. He will be judged according to his works. And there will be no place found for them. They will go where they wanted to go without even knowing the destiny ahead of them into outer darkness. Solomon. But even <clears throat> in John chapter 3, just to finish up, this wonderful passage about life coming sovereignly from God. What do we get when we get to abound verse, verse 14? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Yes, we get again propitiation. We get the foundation. We get God's righteous title to give life to man, sinful man, because the Son of Man was lifted up. And whosoever <clears throat> believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So these things, of course, are woven together. Woven together, God's sovereignly, sovereign work in your soul and mind. And the great work he's accomplished once for all on Calvary's cross. What a testimony God has given to us. And when a person believes the gospel of their salvation, turn in closing to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. In whom, again, in whom, I stress that, in whom, a person. Ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The water, the blood, and for you and me in this present wonderful day, a day of grace, a day of good things, the day of salvation, the accepted time when we put our trust in him, and believe to the saving of our soul, God seals us with his Holy Spirit, preserving us until he redeems us out of this world entirely to be with and like himself. So again, I stress these are wonderful things to consider. The basis in a certain sense of our worship, of our joy, these are wonderful things. But to the soul that's troubled, whether a little child of seven or even three or four, they can enter into Christ, through, enter into heaven through Christ, the open door, believing on him and all the value of these wonderful things. It's made good to every one of us. So I shall stop there. And uh, let's just give thanks and if there's time for